All right, well, good morning, everyone. We're gonna get started. Um, welcome to week two of Curator's Choice, our second uh, live q and I'm Ann Kinseth, I'm the Director of Education at the Meadows Museum, and um, we hope you've been enjoying the course thus far. And I think um, this morning's uh, conversation with Julian Harrison from the uh, British Library will be um, a great way to start your day. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping um, reminders. The first of which is um, we ask that you please keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation so that we don't uh, pick up background noise wherever you are. The second thing is I want to remind you all that we are recording this session and it will end up on our um, course website and eventually on YouTube. So just a heads up that that's happening. And I also want to let you know how we're going to be um, structuring uh, this morning's conversation. We had a number of really fabulous questions submitted through the discussion board on our course, and some of which Amanda Dotsit has already kind of answered. So you can take a look there. And she did that so that we could really um, kind of let our, our presenter today kind of focus in and go in a little bit more depth on fewer questions. So what we'll be doing is going through some of the questions that Amanda did not address. And then should we have additional time at the end, we can open it up for additional questions. Um, and if we do that, we will be using the chat box um, for you to share questions. Um, so it is my absolute pleasure um, to introduce Julian Harrison yet again. So Julian is the lead curator of medieval historical and literary manuscripts at the British Library. He curated the major exhibitions, Harry Potter, A History of Magic in 2017, R. Shakespeare in 2016, and Magna Carta, Magna Carta Law, Liberty, Legacy in 2015. He edits the library's medieval manuscripts blog, um, which was named UK Arts and Culture Blog of the Year in 2014. And among the manuscripts he helps to look after are the unique copy of the old English epic poem Beowulf, the Magna Carta, and of course the topic of our lecture today, the Silos um, Apocalypse. Um, one thing that I will add is that Julian has um, another blog that he uh, creates, and I'll put the link in the chat box. It's called uh, Cradles and Labels, and it focuses on kind of the inside stories from the UK Museum and Gallery. So I really encourage you all to um, check that out uh, following this lecture. I'll share the link. But with that, um, we're going to go ahead and first welcome Julian. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much, Anne. It's a pleasure to, to be here. And um, I've been watching everybody come into the waiting room. Um, I was starting to actually say hello, everybody, as well. It's a, a real pleasure to see you all this morning. I hope you're all well. Great. Well, Julian, we're going to go ahead and get started um, with some of these questions. So, um, Carol Stacy was wondering about uh, kind of where the Silos Apocalypse is stored. Kind of what can you talk and and if it will ever be on view and if so if you have a sense of when so the manuscript itself is one of the british library's greatest treasures and as a result of that we often have it on exhibition at the british library's treasures gallery in london i don't know some of you may have been able to travel to a british library in the past uh obviously at this present moment in time it's really difficult to travel but of course, in the future, we'd love to see you in London to come and see the manuscripts. Um, also in the Treasures Gallery, we have currently on display items such as Magna Carta, the Linus von Gospels, the oldest manuscript Bible in the world. We have handwritten Beatles lyrics, the Gutenberg Bible, Leonardo da Vinci's notebook, um, Shakespeare's first folio. the list goes on and on. Uh, Serious Apocalypse is one of those manuscripts which we have on display in that gallery, but it's not on permanent display. Uh, like many medieval manuscripts, the pages are quite fragile. We don't like them to be exposed to light for too long. So we only display it for maybe six months at a time. It has a, a rotation schedule. Um, but please you know, do come and if you can't see it, you can always view it online as well. I should also add as well, Anne, that um, it may surprise some of the people here today that I've only actually 
been allowed to handle the manuscript itself once in my life. Um, that, that's because it's such a, you know, an important treasure that we don't actually handle our manuscripts unless absolutely necessary. Um, but there may be occasions when a, a reader, a researcher has such important questions that they need to ask that we give them permission to see the original manuscript itself. Um, so that's where the manuscript currently is. Thank you. Um, so we had two questions that I think dealt, dealt with the minuscule script. Um, so sorry, let me just admit some people coming in. Um, so both Maria Lahiri and Carol Stacy were curious about this script. Um, Maria was interested in kind of where this script was primarily used. You know, was this isolated to the Iberian Peninsula? Did you see it in other parts of medieval Europe? Um, and in what ways was it similar or different from medieval Latin variants, Carolingian scripts like that? And then Carol wanted to know um, what does minuscule mean? Um, does it mean all lowercase? Um, was it all lowercase letters? Was it a, a, a variety, right? Uh, so could you talk a little bit more about the script? Yes, exactly. So I mean, first of all, I should add that because the manuscript has such great art historical importance, uh, people who often uh, examine it are primarily focused on the illustrations. But I think really important to examine it in the whole and for that reason I think the script is really important it's really great to understand and uh, manuscript historians are able to date manuscripts often based on the actual style of the script alone and that's year 500 AD all the way up to maybe 1500 the script changed from century to century and also from country to country. And the type of script which we call Visigothic minuscule is located, discovered only in the Iberian Peninsula. That's principally in modern day Spain and Portugal. And it's uh, separate from, but related to other forms of European script, which were written around the same time. So there's another form of script, for example, which is called Carolingian minuscule, which is written really under the, the Caroline Empire, the, um, the area ruled by Charlemagne and his successors. That's Germany and France and parts of Italy. And this Gothic minuscule is very distinctive in its shape for the letter forms. Uh, letters such as B and D and L and H, they have really long, long shafts or ascenders. Uh, there are particular quirks and how the letters are joined together. And as a manuscript historian, you can see that immediately. You can also distinguish script, for example, uh, Anglo-Saxon manuscripts, that's manuscripts made in, in England before the year 1066. The script is always written in very dark ink, very black ink. And say French script, for example, is written often in very brown ink. They use different recipes when making that ink. Hope that, that, hope that gives a very brief explanation. And minuscule, just to say as well, Minuscule means it's the, the lowercase forms of the script, uh, but it would have had uh, uppercase written for titles maybe and for the larger initials which begin each sentence. Thank you. The next question actually comes from me. I uh, took a look at the, the book online, um, the digitized version. And I was curious more about kind of the binding and the cover. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about those. Yes, so the binding of a manuscript is quite interesting. If you go onto our digitized manuscripts website, you can actually see uh, not just the pages of the manuscript, but also the binding. Now, I've been having a look at the images itself and it's actually rather, it's rather difficult to date the binding with great precision. Uh, beyond the fact that it's not clearly a very early medieval binding, not made from the time of the manuscript itself, but it is possible that components of the original medieval binding were reused um, by later binders. I should point out that uh, owners of manuscripts often have a tendency to actually change the book. Um, they might write their name in the book, they might actually trim the pages to make them look consistent, 
they might sometimes rearrange the pages and quite frequently they tend to replace the binding, especially the binding is old, if it's disintegrating or they just want to put their name or their, their coat of arms in the front. So that's essentially what happens with medieval manuscripts. Um, in the case of the Sinatra puppets, it's not quite sure, but there, there might be elements of the original medieval binding which have been reused by the later binders. Thank you. Um, so the date 10, 1091 is obviously an important date uh, for this book and for your for your lecture. Um, and Eugenia was is interested in kind of that dating and kind of why some scholars date it to 1091 and why you take issue with that a little and, and kind of your reasoning for dating it perhaps a little bit earlier. Yeah, so I, I would say that when I first uh, started researching medieval manuscripts, um, I put lots of emphasis into trying to discover uh, where they were made, who they were made for, and also essentially you know, what we can tell about the date the manuscripts were made. This manuscript is actually rather unusual. It actually has dates given in the text, which give you those clues. You now the date 1091, the handwriting, the script of the manuscript was completed in the year 1091. And looking at the descriptions in the, in the published literature, that's why scholars say the manuscript was made in 1091. But if you look at a manuscript of this caliber and of this size, uh, uh, scholars have also uh, analyzed how long it would have taken a scribe to have written a page of text. And we're talking about several hours for one page. And for a book of this length, and we're talking about hundreds of pages, uh, and uh, the way that it's been written, it hasn't been written in a rush, it's been written in a very measured and ordinary form. Uh, one would anticipate that it would have taken several months, at the least, to write. So I think that we should definitely be looking, you know, months, if not a few years before 1091, when it was created. And I mentioned in the lecture, there's also a, a, a campaign of building works at the monastery at the same time. And I think you can suggest that it was being sort of made hand in hand with that building campaign. There's clearly a, a, a lot of patronage of the monastery at that time. And they were uh, creating and not just new books, but they were building a new cloister and so forth. I also think a really interesting uh, feature of this particular manuscript is that if we take the start date as sometime before 1091 and the end date as 1109, that means that it was being made over a period of at least something in the region of 20 years. So it's a real labor of love and it, and it took a long time to produce and it took a, a team of people to make it. Thank you. Um, so during your lecture, you showed us a map. And Mary um, is curious about how legible that map was to you, to your trained eye. And she's wondering if that was kind of the style of map making at the time, if it would have been easily readable by, by people then. Um, uh, and if that was kind of a convention of map making, and if there's other examples. Yes, um, that's a really good question in itself. So, um, you know, like, like medieval manuscripts, uh, the ma medieval maps are also uh, all quite idiosyncratic. Every single one is different. And until even the 16th century, uh, different map makers had different ideas and conventions as to where particular cities, geographical features would be located. Lots of world maps made in the Christian world would have Jerusalem at the center. And sometimes the maps would be round in shape. I mean, interesting, of course, that uh, people were aware that the world was a sphere, uh, but sometimes in a map like this, you can see that there are, the way that the world has been shaped is much more artistic in its convention. I'd, I'd refer you, to, for example, to uh, I don't know, there were some incredibly ornate and intricate, what we call Mapa Mundi world maps, made in the 12th century. Um, there was one made in Germany um, uh, in Ebsfurt. Really sad, it was destroyed by bombing in the Second World War. Um, 
got the most incredible, huge map. There's a, an equivalent in the Hereford Cathedral in England, and uh, that's called the Hereford Map in Lundy. And those maps are really interesting because they actually combine not just geographical features, but they also are, are imposed upon the map um, you know, scenes from uh, world history, biblical history. Um, often and in very early maps, you have areas of maps marked with strange creatures, strange beasts, many headed creatures, uh, areas which say, you know, here, here live beasts and here lie lions and so forth, which really demonstrates that people at a time in history uh, hadn't necessarily traveled to those parts of the world. And of course, the incredible thing, of course, is that many of the map makers themselves were had never left their monasteries either. And we know lots of instances of medieval monks who are uh, wrote world histories, but very rarely traveled beyond the confines of their own monastery. So they were dependent upon information that was shared with them by travelers and by earlier historical accounts. And in case someone like the Seals Apocalypse potentially uh, Petros, who was drawing a map, may have drawn upon earlier models, including maps dating back to Roman times. Thank you. So the next question comes from Allison, and uh, I'm just going to read this one. So Allison wants to know what limitations did illustrators have regarding their work? Was there artistic freedom in how they represented what they depicted? Were they allowed to select which passages to illustrate, which borders to create? Yeah, that, 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 I'm amazed. So many of the questions have been just really, the questions today are brilliant. And I, I really, I love reading them beforehand. And thinking about this question in particular, so did the scribe have artistic, uh, an artist have artistic license to change uh, or to use their own um, vision of how they represented the imagery on the page. So a manuscript like the Silas Apocalypse, you can definitely see the artists and the scribes must have been collaborating. You know, the scribes definitely left room for the artists to add the illustrations. And therefore, it would have been possible for the illustrators to have read the text in advance and to have suggested you know, I would like to depict Noah's Ark, for example, or Christ in majesty, or uh, the woman with the many-headed beasts. And at the same time, uh, how they represented those images may have been left primarily to their own discretion. But you do sometimes see hints in medieval manuscripts that there has been a a kind of preparatory campaign before the, the illustrations have been added, where either the illustrations have been uh, sketched out maybe in what we call plummet. Plummet is actually essentially pencil. So you maybe sometimes see underdrawings on the pages. Sometimes the underdrawings have been rubbed out, but occasionally they can still be discovered using uh, a technique known as multispectral imaging. Um, a modern technique to use might be using uh, ultraviolet light to see what lies behind the drawings. And also, sometimes uh, the scribes left little notes in the margins telling the illustrator what they should be drawing. And they're really interesting. Uh, often they just use shorthand, little notes written in the, sort of like a, a shorthand script in the margins, um, sometimes in the, the gutters of the manuscripts. Rather interesting. Sometimes those, uh, those notes have uh, then been removed. Uh, by the artist or by the scribe, um, but on times are uh, also uh, those notes are have inadvertently remained in the manuscript, and we can still read them today. And that's really fundamentally important because that's the thing which actually gives us a clue as to you know how the, the artist was instructed to choose their images. I hope that answers your question, but it's no, it, it, no. But there are lots of different dimensions and, and concepts to how images in a manuscript like the Silas Apocalypse or made. Thank you. So I think we have one more question before we um, open it up to the group today for additional questions. So um, would you be able to talk more about the purpose of this book? 
Yeah, this is something I was thinking about. Um, I'm particular as I was uh, writing my lecture and as I was presenting it, and then as I was thinking about the questions for today. So, as I'm trying to hint, uh, a book like this, obviously it's revered today for its artistic legacy, its artistic importance, but who would have actually used it at the time it was made? And I would suggest that on the one hand, uh, the making of this book was clearly an act of devotion on the part of the scribes and on the part of the artists and on the part of the abbots who commissioned it and potentially the people, the patrons of the monastery who may have helped to, to pay for the making of the manuscript. But at the same time, the sheer quality and a number of the illustrations suggests to me that it may have been intended for the instruction of the monks, or maybe the novices in the manuscript. I'm thinking of pages, uh, you know, a page like uh, the Map of Mundi, or a page like a uh, Noah's Ark. I think it's really important to, to show that, even if you couldn't read the text, just by looking at the illustrations on the page, you would have instantly recognized what was being described. And, uh, and also, pages like this in a manuscript, such as the Seal of the Apocalypse, uh, no, in a way, they're almost like bookmarks for people to read through the text. They help you find your location in the text of the manuscript itself. So, you know, in the sequence that the, the pages describe um, uh, scenes from the Book of Revelation, you can map your way through the manuscript. So, purpose for learning, obviously, it's a commentary on the Apocalypse and on the Book of Daniel and on other texts. Um, but I am particularly drawn to the fact that uh, the artwork, the illustrations, the decoration in a manuscript such as this uh, really is a pointer to the fact that uh, the people or some of the readers of this book may have been less literate than others, but they still would be able to comprehend the story of the book um, by consulting and by having the images explained to them. Julian, I, I wondered um, if you've seen any evidence of particular use in this book. So certain pages that have, you know, smudges, or I know some of the Beatus manuscripts, the, the characters of the devil, their eyes have been scratched out and um, things like that, or evidence of, of kissing the pages, that sort of thing. Do you know of any instances of that in this particular codex? Well, actually, strange enough, the manuscript is rather clean. Oh. I, say clean, I say clean in the sense that, first of all, it doesn't have, um, it hasn't been heavily uh, annotated or right. corrected, changed by later owners. And, um, and also, dare I say, not necessarily it's modern conventions, but um, particularly in the past, uh, conservators and earlier owners were actually known, you can clean the pages of your parchment manuscripts. Mm. Uh, and, and that really intrigues me. What you've just said is really important because when our modern day uh, researchers are looking at a manuscript like this, you're looking at clues as who might have used it in the past. And you're absolutely right. Sometimes you look at medieval manuscripts, you see fingerprints, you see uh, people who have corrected the text, you see evidence that they've been kissing the pages. Um, you and I know as well, sometimes you see the fact that like uh, people, there are imprints on pages which have been left by people's spectacles or have been left by um, pens or you see cat's paw prints on the pages. I, I was thinking of the cat paw prints. I love that. But, but they, they are amazing, aren't they? Now, um, Serious Apocalypse doesn't have that. Um, and yet, at the same time, um, it's not so pristine in its condition, which suggests to me that nobody's ever consulted it. But it's just such a wow of a manuscript, isn't it? It's so beautiful that you know, every single person who's ever come into contact with this book must have appreciated how how beautiful it was and has, has treated it with such great reverence. Um, I hope that answers your question, Amanda. It, it's, you know, but it, no, it, it, 
It absolutely does because I was thinking of some of the earlier Beatus manuscripts that are not in nearly as good condition. Um, I think it's the, is it the Girona Beatus maybe? It has a very similar Noah scene, but it's it's just not in as good as condition as this one. Um, and of course, one of my, you know, things to do before I die is to see this manuscript, right? So <laughs> add it to the list. I've seen the Leon Bible, so I've got one Mozarabic <laughs> well, under my well, belt, but. <laughs> well, obviously next time you and everybody comes to London and, you know, it is a manuscript which is fairly frequently displayed in our treasures gallery. Yeah. So, you know, come and say hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hold you to that. <laughs> Well, Julian, I think we have um, one more question that's just come through in the chat box. So Victoria wants to know how many um, of these kinds of manuscripts have you researched and are there ones that are, I guess, on your to-do list, ones that you want to, to study? Oh, wow. Uh, my to-do list. That's really, that's a lovely question. So, uh, well, talking about this particular, um, this particular text with Beata de Ljubljana, it's called the Apocalypse. Um, we know in the region of about 20 manuscripts which have survived. Um, but when I say have survived, the likelihood is that there were far more made in the first instance. And I think that's something that's just really, really significant as well. Sometimes modern scholars are uh, maybe make assumptions about the importance of particular texts just based on the either the numbers that have survived or the numbers that haven't. And uh, there are works by particular medieval authors which we know must have been really important but when it came to uh in england for example in the 16th century at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries uh there was a, a even a, a campaign uh you know, coordinated with king henry VIII himself where manuscripts were being uh rescued and saved for posterity but they focused on particular types of manuscripts and so and uh, everyday manuscripts, maybe even things like Bibles, there were just so many of them, they weren't all kept. So they had to be really high caliber if they were saved. A manuscript that I would really like to see, and I haven't had the opportunity to see. Well, good question. Um, there's some fantastic manuscripts in, in um, libraries and museums in the United States of America. Um, I've been privileged in the past to go to the Getty, um, in Los Angeles to see some of their manuscripts and if you ever get that opportunity do go there. Uh, Pierpont Morgan Library in New York, um, they have some extraordinary manuscripts. I mean, it's including, including a Beatus. <laughs> yeah, they absolutely, they absolutely have. And I mean, the, the, the interesting thing is, uh, Amanda would be aware is that these are still books which are available for consultation. You, you can go and handle them and you know, the very first time you ever handle a medieval book, your, your hands start to tremble. You know, like, you just think like, and then you just think like, gosh, you know, this book was made by somebody 800 years ago or, or even earlier. I've been privileged. I've, I have touched, you now I, I love to tell people, I have touched Magna Carta. No, I have touched Shakespeare's first Shakespeare. folio. Shakespeare! Ah! I've, I've touched the Codex Sinaiticus. Um, and yet every single time you, you do, when I say I've touched them, you know, just, I, I don't handle them as a necessity, yes. Um, so, yeah, a manuscript I really, really, really would like to see. It's, it's worth Maybe. saying um, how big these are too, Julian. Sorry to yeah. interrupt you. Yeah, do you want to say something about that briefly? Oh, I was just going to say the, the, I don't know what the exact dimensions of these are, but um, when when Julian talks about handling a manuscript, um, it, it, these aren't small things that you hold in your hands. Think about, you know, they're made from the sides of, you know, the parchment comes from an animal, right? So they're actually really, really quite big. Um, this one's probably at least a foot tall, isn't it? Or larger? It's, it's, yeah, at least. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a large book. Yeah. And uh, you can instantly tell and in heavy. the middle ages that so yeah. books such as our uh, uh, devotional manuscripts, um, uh, religious books often tend to be quite large. They might be displayed on an altar or maybe used um, um, on a lectern in the church. Um, and then you have very small books, which are undoubtedly could have been kept by the monks and nuns in the pockets. Yeah, 
little pocket books even hung around their necks um, like almost as amulets or as relics. I'm sorry, I stopped you right before <laughs> the little lag and the time here, right before you said the book you want to get your hands on, which might be what we um, end with. Uh, I'm actually going to cheat. Um, it's not a book. So can I say, but I just like immediately thinking, actually, I refer to it in this particular lecture, the Bayer Tapestry. Oh, okay, I mean, of course. Like, of course. <laughs> Of a bear tapestry that, uh, I, again, people at this lecture may not realise that the um, the really fantastic bit about the bear tapestry is the back of the tapestry. Um, if you ever get the chance to see the back, to see the images of the back, um, you can see all the stitches, you can see the modern repairs. Um, the uh, the colours. The colours. And, and lots of bits were restored in the 19th century. Um, the arrow in King Harold's eye was added in the 19th century. So, or was it there beforehand? Do we know? I just, yeah. Every time you look at a medieval manuscript, though, you learn new things. Um, and and it, it, the bio tapestry is still going to be in England, isn't it? Well, while the, or we don't know. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I think it's our art it's gossip it's here. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So just to let people know that there has been a suggestion that um, the, the museum where it's currently kept is due to be uh, closed for renovations in a few years' time. And the French government um, offered to send it to England for the duration while it was, while the museum was, um, but that's still open to discussions. But that will be the best exhibition. Um, if I could curate that exhibition, that would be the, the be all and end all. <laughs> well, I am going to jump in because I am timekeeper and Julian is at the end of his work week and I want to be very Yay. respectful of him uh, getting into his weekend. Um, so we're going to end here. But Julian, thank you so much for not only contributing such a fascinating lecture this week, but for joining us this morning um, and answering so many of our questions and more. So thank you very, very much. It's been a pleasure. Um, uh, thank you so much, Anne and Amanda, for inviting me. Um, and thank you to everybody who actually came to the lecture today. Um, Hope you're having a good day as well. I know it's very early in the morning, relatively speaking, over there. Um, but thank you for the wonderful questions, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your course as well. Thank you. And for everyone in the course on Monday, I will be posting our next video lecture by Akemi Herwith Vostrink, um, um, who will be focusing on the National Gallery in London. And we will see you all a week from now, same, same place, same time, 10.30 a.m. for our next Q&A session. So thank you so very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye.